coming up on City Scene, Sioux Falls Fire Rescue heads west to help communities battling forest fires. Then we get an update on the Midco Aquatic Center and see how pickleball is going to become even more popular in Sioux Falls. Welcome to City Scene, right here on City Link, where each month we go all around the departments in the city of Sioux Falls. And today we start with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, where crews are heading west to help communities out there in the Black Hills as they fight forest fires. Hi, this is Division Chief Brad Goodwill with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Today we're here to talk about uh, wildland firefighting. With me today is Fire Captain Trent Bow. Uh, Trent has been on several deployments uh, out west different firefighting, uh, wildland firefighting scenarios. You know, right now we've got the fire season's really kicking off here, kind of wildland firefighting in this area and especially out west. So Trent, I know you've been on several deployments. Could you uh, describe when Sioux Falls Fire Rescue goes on a call, um, how are they called up? Are they on a list or how does that work? Um, out there in Rapid City, there's a dispatch called Great Plains Dispatch and they're for the Rocky Mountain area. And when they get uh, a call for a fire somewhere, they'll go through that dispatch and if we're available and we've listed with them then they'll call us and we'll have to go so about every Thursday we got to active put one of our trucks on there or two trucks on there and that details of calling you know calling our engine bosses find out if we're available to go or not and be available for 14 days or more while we go out there so then once that happens we got an hour to respond and be out the door and on the road heading to where wherever we're supposed to be going Sure, and once you get where you're going, kind of describe what the lifestyle is like there. What do you guys do when you're out there for those two weeks, and, and what kind of working conditions are you working under? Well, for, for the, these big fires that we go on out, out, we go on out there, um, there'll be, you'll, you'll arrive at base camp. There'll be one big camp, and they'll give you an assignment. Either it'll put you on a division of some sort. Uh, sometimes with type sixes, they'll put you right on the front lines where you're assisting with the burnout operations, and you're assisting with hose lays uh, to the hand crews that are out there. So, and that, over the course of time, you, you're, you're, you might change. So as you go and you fight that fire and the fire gets farther and farther along in its thing, um, it's now longer, it's, it's no longer a, a fighting the fire. Now you're trying to contain it. Sure, it sounds like a lot of training. So um, is everybody on Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, are they wildland firefighters? Are they all able to go out there? Yes, a few years ago we got um, into the wildland thing and we had everybody go through the firefighter type two program. So everybody in Sioux Falls Fire Rescue is, is firefighter two or higher. So yes, anybody can go and we're able to go out there fully trained and, uh, and assist whenever possible. One thing good about what Sioux Falls Fire Rescue is doing is that we're able to assist our, our, uh, our fellow neighbors out west. And that's one thing that I think that we do well in realizing that we're not just a, a city department helping just the city of Sioux Falls. We look at the full thing that we're one big family out there well, good. Well, thank you, Trent, and thank you to all the other firefighters in Sioux Falls that have gone um, and taken those extra two weeks to go and leave their families and go outside of Sioux Falls and travel out west and to help other departments and um, other communities out with, with that. And again, it just goes to show that Sioux Falls Fire Rescue does more than just putting out fires and going on EMS calls right here in the city limits. We're here to help out um, the rest of the state and other states throughout the west. And as those fire crews help out west, it's construction crews here in town that are making some major progress on the Midco Aquatic Center. Well, the majority of the major construction inside the building is completed. The heavy uh, walls and concrete that's been poured for all the swimming pools, that's already been completed. Now what we're really working on are the interior finishes of the building itself, the equipment, the tile finishes, uh, and eventually the pool finishes as well. Uh, we're working on the outside landscaping as well, we're starting that work, and as well as uh, working on the park improvements on the northwest corner of the park. Well, first and foremost, it's a year-round option for people. Instead of being able to swim you know, 70 to 80 days out of the year, you're going to be able to swim 360 days out of the year. Uh, the other thing that I think you'll find is that uh, we don't have a pool where we have two low diving boards and two high diving boards in the same facility. Uh, this is our first uh, 10 lane, 50 meter facility. Uh, we have 20 short course lanes, we have 10 long course lanes, and we've got two movable bulkheads on the 50 meter side of the, of the facility. So it's gonna have incredible multi-purpose. Uh, we have spectator seating that none of our other facilities have. Plus we are uh, replicating some of those other features that we have on our outdoor pools because they are so popular, water slides, zero depth entry, 
Uh, we also have a warm water pool, which is unique to this facility as well. That would be a, not only available for therapy, but also for swimming lessons, uh, other recreation programming, and just open swim. And so there's just a lot of different options that this facility provide. But foremost, uh, you know, the big thing for us is that having a year-round facility. One of the things I think that's most unique as we've traveled uh, across the country looking at other facil similar facilities uh, in order to design ours the way we want to design it is that where we're at right now on the con concourse level, uh, the mezzanine level where uh, folks are going to be able to be able to view the recreational side of the facility as well as the 50 meter competitive facility uh, both on the same level and uh, it's unlike any other facility that we've visited across the country and uh, we really think that's going to be a unique feature uh, for people to be able to enjoy uh, viewing uh, spectators in, either on the rec side or on the 50 meter side. In the coming weeks we think we'll have a little better idea of uh, an actual uh, time frame of when we'll, we would open. We're still saying fall of, of this year at this point. There, there's, even though it looks pretty well complete, there's a lot of work left to be done and so we're uh, not real comfortable uh, saying a date at this point. And of course, when the Aquatic Center opens, I'm sure it will make quite a splash in town. But so are some pickleball courts. That's right, pickleball courts that are getting to be quite popular. Five years ago, uh, we heard from a, from a couple folks that uh, vacationed in, in the warmer weather uh, states and they, they wanted to bring pickleball, pickleball back to Sioux Falls. Um, we started in the community centers uh, with some temporary courts there. Uh, during the winter time and then watching the demand come, watching them uh, form a pick pickleball club here in Sioux Falls and, uh, and getting their numbers up. Uh, we just thought it was time and uh, basically public-private partnership came, came about. Uh, both sides put in about $30,000. Um, them with the concrete and kiosks and the fencing and then us with sports coats and uh, permanent nets. Uh, made it happen and uh, now you have your first uh, six courts here in Sioux Falls. Basically it's played with a, with a different paddle um, and then with uh, almost like a wiffle ball type ball to it so basically there's not as, as much space needed for a pickleball court. Uh, the pickleball courts basically uh, two courts can fit inside uh, one tennis court and with a, with a two court system and the space in between, you can turn that into six pickleball courts. All ages can play pickleball, uh, that's the beauty of it. Um, it doesn't take as much of the skill that you have for tennis, so basically you get a lot of success right away and then you, and then you learn how to get better and get hooked on the sport and you can't put it down. If you're interested in playing, uh, definitely call Sioux Falls Park and Rec. Uh, we can hook you up with the Sioux Falls Pickleball Club. Uh, they also have uh, their contacts uh, with us as well, so uh, we'll get you hooked up, get you in the right club, show you how to play, and uh, get you out in the courts. All right, I might need to start brushing up on my rules of pickleball to get a little better at the game. And of course, pickleball is a great way to stay in shape, and getting your exercise is just one of the things that the health department wants folks to focus on after they looked at the 2016 Community Needs Assessment and health concerns in our city. Thanks for joining us today. We're here to talk a little bit about our Community Health Needs Assessment. So Mary Michaels, our Public Health Prevention Coordinator for the City of Sioux Falls Health Department, we recently with some partners did a survey and a needs assessment for the health of our community. So talk to us a little bit about that, Mary. Okay, well the community health needs assessment process is something that the hospitals actually are required to do by law every three years. And as nonprofit hospitals in our community, both Avera and Sanford also have to show that they are providing community benefit and how they are reinvesting that profit into the community. And so what we were able to do this year was partner and compile one complete comprehensive look at the health of our community. This is the first time that we have done a collaborative needs assessment with both health systems. So it's a, a unique opportunity, but very exciting to bring both health systems together with the public health department and really look at all aspects of our health. And so we looked at things that are um, beyond what you think of in traditional healthcare uh, with quality of life things like employment, education, housing, transportation, and how those things affect our health as well as the more traditional health indicators like 
obesity, diabetes, cancer, physical activity, tobacco use, behavioral health, and really we're able to put together one picture of health in Sioux Falls. That's a large undertaking. We have a big community here. Uh, took some time, I would imagine, for all put all of that together? This process took about a year and a half because we did it in sections. We did a resident survey that was a scientific randomized survey asking residents some questions about not only their personal health, but also their perceptions about health and safety and quality of life in the community. We also hosted a series of focus groups where we brought business leaders, education, nonprofits, individuals who are served by nonprofits um, from all sectors of the community to ask them what they saw some of the pressing needs in our community. And then we had a series of meetings where we actually had a tool that scored some of those things that happened both in policy that might impact health, like we think about our statewide smoke-free law, that's a policy, or things that happen just environmentally or um, just kind of in, as a matter of fact in different situations, the way a work site might have a healthy vending policy or allow employees times for physical activity. So we got a little bit of input from all sectors of the community, as well as looked at national data, state data, and used all of that together to actually pr uh, produce our final report. Wow, that is a lot of work. So what are some of the top things that you found? Well, there are certainly a number of health factors that we're still seeing in the community, things like tobacco use, um, diabetes, cancer, incidence of heart disease, and those kinds of things. But what really rose to the top are three issues that we as partners identified, uh, one being obesity, the second is behavioral health and substance use, and the third one was actually access to care. And that means a number of different things. It might mean whether somebody has an identified primary care provider, but access to care can also involve the cost of care, whether people can pay for their health care or their health insurance, whether they have transportation to get to a health care appointment, or just their understanding of what resources might be available and how those resources are coordinated, say, between a medical provider and then maybe one of our nonprofit agencies that helps with housing or medication assistance or transportation or other needs. Okay, so some of the statistics behind those three top areas, can you elaborate just a little bit on those and what we might be able to do to address some of that? Sure. In the area of obesity, we are still seeing about two-thirds of our adults as overweight or obese using kind of that BMI or that body mass index scale. So we have not moved the needle very much on that. And that really boils down to our nutrition and our physical activity. Unfortunately, Sioux Falls still ranks among the lowest in the nation for our fruit and vegetable consumption, where we're seeing less than 10% of adults getting enough fruits and vegetables every day. And the young people in our community they aren't really doing much better. I mean, the school nutrition adds a little bit of a benefit there for those younger ages. But once you get to your teenage years and older, um, it's really become a challenge. And so we're looking at how do we help people get more access to fruits and vegetables. And then in the area of physical activity, less than half of adults get the recommended 150 minutes a week of physical activity. And during the survey process, we found that there were only about 20 percent of adults who even had done physical activity outside of their normal routine in the past 30 days. So we need to make sure that our community is making it easier for people to be physically active as a regular part of their lives. It's easy to walk or bike, um, to be physically on a, active on a normal daily basis, not necessarily pack up your bag and go to the gym, but working that into the daily life. In the area of behavioral health and substance use, we are finding that people are having issues with anxiety, stress, depression, and when they were surveyed, there were about 13% of people who had eight or more poor mental health days over the course of a month. We are seeing increase in drug arrests. We are seeing that seven or eight percent of adults um, had tested positive for marijuana use over the last year. We're seeing many that have started this um, substance use under the age of 12. So that has become a widespread issue and, and behavioral health can impact your physical health. They're very closely tied together. And then in access to care, the biggest gap really that was identified was kind of what's called that handoff from a medical provider to a social service agency or the other way around where somebody is needing help in many aspects of their life and how do we make that as easy and seamless for that person as possible. Okay, so we've identified some issues in our community at this point and so what um, are we going to do moving forward? Well, although the three partners have 
their own plans. There are activities that Avera or Sanford or the Sioux Falls Health Department might be doing independently. We did agree on three collaborative strategies we felt are important to look at as a community, and that really matches up to those top three health issues. One project that's really exciting is called Hayward Thrive, and that's really looking at a neighborhood that is impacted by a number of factors that impact that affect the individual's health, like lack of access to healthy foods or some transportation challenges that might make it hard for them to be physically active. And um, so that in that Hayward neighborhood, we have the school, we have a community center, and then Falls Community Health has a clinic right there in the school. So we're using that as a model to try to deliver some programs and services and really engage the neighbors to help us understand what they need out there and impact some of these health determinants. So that is a collaborative project. The second one is bringing together a group of behavioral health professionals and agencies that work with behavioral health in the community and look at what some of those needs are and how we as community partners can address those. And then the third one with access to care, there's an or, a group called the Sioux Empire Network of Care and that's um, organized by the Helpline Center and many other partners looking at how do we establish a database and resources to help connect people to those resources so they can get that seamless care no matter what their need might be. Well, that is a lot of work and a lot of things moving forward. If people would like to read the Community Health Needs Assessment um, in its entirety, which it sounds like it's quite the lengthy document, where can they go to read that? To find more information, they can visit our website, which is livewellsoupfalls.org, and you click on the About Us button, and our full report is there, as well as a brief infographic that really does highlight some of the major issues look that we're looking at and our strategies that we're going to be working on here in the next few years. Well, a lot of work. We look forward to hearing the, the progress of this report. So thanks for joining us today, Mary. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share. Now from your personal health to the health of the environment. Recycling is a key component to keeping our city green and healthy. That's why a new tire recycling program is going to help out. Hi, I'm Dustin Hanson, Landfill Superintendent for the City of Sioux Falls. Today we're here at the uh, Sioux Falls Regional Sanitary Landfill to talk about our tire recycling program. Back in the middle of June, we started accepting tires for free from non-commercial residents. That's anybody in our five county region, uh, Lake, Lincoln, Minnehaha, McCook, and Turner counties. Uh, you can bring your tires in for free. Um, we have some tires here next to me, from the small to the big tires, we'll take them all for free. The process still works the same. You'll come to the scale house, let them know what you have on your load. If it's just tires, they'll check you in, direct you where to go, uh, and you can dump your tires off and exit the uh, landfill. If you have other items on, the, on your load, then you will have to pay those accordingly, um, our flat fees or per tonnage fees. Um, just remember to uh, strap or tarp your loads. Uh, a few things that we'll do with the tires, the tires will sit here and get picked up by a contractor. Um, those will be taken to a processing facility, ground up and used for various uh, types of uh, projects, such as construction projects, um, in roads, um, used as energy um, and also used as things as uh, AstroTurf. The reason we started the, the free recycling program is to reduce the amount of tires that um, are out in the uh, environment. Uh, tires are, uh, can pose a risk to the environment such as uh, mosquitoes. It, uh, there's a, an excellent breeding ground for mosquitoes. Uh, any, any way you lay a tire there's a little bit of water that can sit in it after a rain and it can sit in there for a considerable amount of time. Uh, there's also a safety uh, aspect to this where if a tire catches on fire um, it takes a lot of resources to put those put that tire fire out. So once again if you're just bringing tires out to the landfill you'll check in at the scale house let them know how many tires you have on your load. Uh, we still like to check them in as small, medium, large size tires uh, and then you'll be directed to route one where you'll drop them off. If you have other materials on your load you'll be charged accordingly um, and directed to the uh, appropriate routes. And of course, that tire recycling program is a great way to keep the city healthy. Those tires can hold a lot of water that can breed mosquitoes and other pests, so getting them recycled can help reduce problems that can be caused by that. Another issue when it comes to water are storm drain inlets in Sioux Falls. And Jessica, tell us why you want folks to be aware of what does and doesn't go in those inlets. Hi, I'm Jessica Langen, Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Sioux Falls. I'm here today to talk to you about the Downtown Storm Inlet Painting Project. So this project is a new water quality awareness campaign uh, that we are using local artists and local organizations to help us uh, bring attention to the city's storm sewer system using storm inlets downtown Sioux Falls. 
So a lot of people don't realize that the sanitary sewer system and the storm drainage system are two separate utilities. So all of the water that flows over the city surfaces and into the storm drains actually gets discharged into the Big Sioux River with little or no treatment. Um, so we wanted to raise attention, uh, raise awareness about the city storm sewer system so that we could maybe help prevent some potential pollutants from going down our storm sewer system. So the artists are all local artists. A lot of them are from our certified green business leaders and they are just uh, local artists who are donating their time and, and their talents to help out with this project. So if you'd like to find out more information about the stormwater inlets and the art that's on the inlets, you can visit SiouxFalls.org slash green. And while those storm drains are getting a new coat of paint and a message to go with them, there's a library in Sioux Falls that's also getting spruced up. Hi, I'm Karen Schleicher, branch manager here at Kaylee Library to talk to you about the upcoming renovation. Uh, we will be closed beginning Monday, July 18th for approximately four months um, to get this renovation done on time. Um, we will um, be closed for the entire period of the construction, which will include some exterior work, um, new siding, new roof on the children's area, as well as some new windows. Um, we will also be doing some major interior remodel as well. Uh, new paint, new shelves, new carpet, um, and some interactive learning areas in the children's wing, as well as a renovated teen space and some enhanced space for our computer users. You'll find a new welcoming atmosphere um, with lots of browsing shelves um, for materials and staff assistance to help you with downloadables when we reopen in late 2016. The Cayley Library was originally built in 1988, and then it was also added on in 2002 with a children's area, and so we're coming up on just about 30 years of the Cayley Library being open, and so it's time for an um, uplift, um, some major renovations as far as upkeep of the building, just a nice facelift. You know, our customers are used to coming in every day, but there are some um, aspects of our building that are getting older and we just need to make sure that those are in good condition for our future customers as well. Um, when the, the Cayley Library was built 30 years ago, um, a lot of our customer interactions were in person. Um, a lot of the programs that we offer are, are you come to the library. Technology has changed quite a bit since then. Um, we do offer computer use in the library as well as um, public Wi-Fi um, that is free. Um, but a lot of the programs that we offer um, that we have offered in the past and continue to offer today, we will still offer you know, in the years to come. So things like puppet shows and book clubs, story times, programs that point to lifelong learning and education, we will continue to have those long into the future. And so part of this renovation addresses that. So some of the things in the children's area are interactive, hands-on manipulatives so that children can learn in a variety of different ways, not just hearing stories, but um, touching things that help them learn. Um, they can see things that help them learn. Um, same thing with our teens. We're gonna have some interactives um, in that area some group study rooms because the way that people use libraries has changed over the years. Um, so many times people just came to the library to get a book and, and they would leave. Now it's you come to the library and you meet with your friends or use a study room um, for tutoring or learning or proctoring an exam. So we're going to have a lot of that you know, into the future and that's why we're doing this renovation as well. And then just as a reminder, the Cayley Branch Library will be closed mid-July um, through late 2016. All of the services that you're used to receiving at the Cayley Library, whether it's picking up your reserve materials, um, puppet shows, programs, story times, all of those services will be offered at our other branches as well. Um, we look forward to seeing you in late 2016. Be sure to come back and see our remodel at that time. Thanks. <coughs> Now, if you're over at the library and checking out those renovations, maybe some books on animals, why not go also see some of those animals in person at Jungle Jubilee? Kylie, give us the details. I'm Kylie Bream, Senior Director of Communications at the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum of Natural History. And we are busy preparing for our annual adults only fundraising event called Jungle Jubilee. This year's Jungle Jubilee event has a new twist. We're calling it Jungle Jubilee, bash for the bears and all proceeds are going to benefit our upcoming brown bear exhibit renovation. 
It's going to be a great night of live music from Shades, great cocktails and drinks from Cleavers, and of course everyone's favorite, Up Close Animal Encounters. This year's event will not only help raise funds for our brown bear exhibit, it'll get adults up close to some of their favorite animals. We're also offering a VIP ticket where a small group of adults can come early and feed a rhino and go behind the scenes with our brown bear kenai. This year's Jungle Jubilee event will also be a little different in the fact that we are cutting out the silent auction. We're dialing back the live auction so that we can spend more time just having, enjoying a great evening at the Great Plains Zoo. We'll also have fun activities like raffles and a wine pull so that everyone can participate and help support the zoo's brown bear exhibit renovation project. Tickets and more event information are available at our website, greatzoo.org, or by calling the zoo at 367-8313, extension 121. Jungle Jubilee is our largest fundraising event of the year. We've been working and planning for months. Um, our staff and volunteers are so excited to show off our incredible zoo and have a great evening outside. And finally today, what's old is new at the Old Courthouse Museum with a new exhibit with lithographic prints. Welcome to the new exhibit, uh, George Catlin, Life Among the North American Indians here at the Old Courthouse Museum. Uh, the exhibit is a collection of 25 lithographic prints produced in 1844. Uh, the prints belonged originally to Richard Franklin Pettigrew and have uh, recently been conserved by a professional art conservator, but are a great insight to life here in Dakota along the Missouri River in 1832. The prints you're going to see depict buffalo hunting, hunting antelope, different life and dances of the Native Americans, um, some really fabulous details and topography of Dakota. Uh, it, it's really an exhibit that um, has some fantastic views and snapshots of the past. George Catlin originally traveled up the Missouri, well, he took five trips to the West uh, between 1830 and 1835. Uh, this group of lithographs uh, was produced by Catlin in 1844, representing views of his 1832 trip up the Missouri River. And, and he made these lithographs to make some money but uh, they're actually a process where he engraved a piece of limestone imported from Germany uh, to make the prints and then the artist himself hand tinted each of the prints. While there are a few copies of these floating around, these aren't the kind of thing you're just going to see anywhere uh, and they are part of the permanent collection of the Siouxland Heritage Museums. George Catlin was not without a sense of humor, and uh, while some of these depict different uh, groups of Indians stalking buffalo and uh, hunting them in different techniques in the snow, on the prairie dressed up as wolves, on horseback, one of my favorite prints is uh, sort of the buffalo chasing back, and it's a self-portrait by, of George Catlin, and he's being chased by a buffalo. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think that's really entertaining. Um, but there's some just fabulous detail of the Native Americans, of the different tribes, the uh, Mandan, uh, some of the Arikara, Os Osage, who were living along the Missouri in the 1830s, and also the animals and things that you saw along the way. The Old Courthouse Museum is open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 5 on Saturday, noon to 5 on Sunday, and Thursday evenings till 9. Uh, and you can come, admission is free, and you're welcome to come in and visit this exhibit anytime over the next year or so. That looks like a great exhibit. Thanks, Bill. If you missed anything here and you want to take a look back, all you need to do is head over to SiouxFalls.org. You can check out past shows there or our YouTube channel. And until then, we'll see you back here next month.